The Alchemy of Happiness by Abu Hamid al-Ghazali Translated by Claude Field Introduction No, O beloved, that man was not created in jest or at random, but marvelously made and for some great end, although he is not from everlasting, yet he lives forever, and though his body is mean and earthly, yet his spirit is lofty and divine. When in the crucible of abstinence, he is purged from carnal passions, he attains to the highest, and in place of being a slave to lust and anger, becomes endued with angelic qualities. Attaining that state, he finds his heaven in the contemplation of eternal beauty, and no longer in fleshly delights. The spiritual alchemy which operates this change in him, like that which transmutes base metals into gold, is not easily discovered. Nor to be found in the house of every old woman, it is to explain that alchemy and its methods of operation that the author has undertaken this work, which he has entitled, The Alchemy of Happiness. Now the treasuries of God, in which this alchemy is to be sought, are the hearts of the prophets, and he who seeks it elsewhere will be disappointed and bankrupt on the day of judgment when he hears the words, We have lifted the veil from off thee, and thy sight today is keen. God has sent on earth 124,000 prophets to teach men the prescription of this alchemy, and how to purify their hearts from baser qualities in the crucible of abstinence. This alchemy may be briefly described as turning away from the world to God, and its constituents are for, the knowledge of self, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of this world as it really is, the knowledge of the next world as it really is. We shall now proceed to expound these four constituents in order. Chapter 1. Knowledge of Self Knowledge of self is the key to the knowledge of God, according to the saying, He who knows himself knows God, and, as it is written in the Quran, we will show them our signs in the world and in themselves, that the truth may be manifest to them. Now nothing is nearer to thee than thyself, and if thou knowest not thyself how canst thou know anything else? If thou sayest I know myself, meaning thy outward shape, body, face, limbs, and so forth, such knowledge can never be a key to the knowledge of God. Nor, if thy knowledge as to that which is within only extends so far, that when thou art hungry thou eatest, and when thou art angry thou attackest someone, wilt thou progress any further in this path, for the beasts are thy partners in this? But real self-knowledge consists in knowing the following things, what art thou in thyself, and from whence hast thou come, whither art thou going, and for what purpose hast thou come to tarry here a while, and in what does thy real happiness and misery consist? Some of thy attributes are those of animals, some of devils, and some of angels, and thou hast to find out which of these attributes are accidental and which essential. Till thou knowest this, thou canst not find out where thy real happiness lies. The occupation of animals is eating, sleeping, and fighting, therefore, if thou art an animal, busy thyself in these things. Devils are busy in stirring up mischief, and in guile and deceit, if thou belongest to them, do their work. Angels contemplate the beauty of God, and are entirely free from animal qualities, if thou art of angelic nature, then strive towards thine origin, that thou mayest know and contemplate the Most High, and be delivered from the thraldom of lust and anger. Thou shouldest also discover why thou hast been created with these two animal instincts, whether that they should subdue and lead thee captive, or whether that thou shouldest subdue them, and, in thy upward progress, make of one thy steed and of the other thy weapon. The first step to self-knowledge is to know that thou art composed of an outward shape, called the body, and an inward entity called the heart, or soul. By heart, I do not mean the piece of flesh situated in the left of our bodies, but that which uses all the other faculties as its instruments and servants. In truth it does not belong to the visible world, but to the invisible, and has come into this world as a traveller visits a foreign country for the sake of merchandise, and will presently return to its native land. It is the knowledge of this entity and its attributes which is the key to the knowledge of God. Some idea of the reality of the heart, or spirit, may be obtained by a man closing his eyes and forgetting everything around except his individuality. He will thus also obtain a glimpse of the unending nature of that individuality. Too close inquiry, however, into the essence of spirit is forbidden by the law. In the Quran it is written, they will question thee concerning the spirit, say, the spirit comes by the command of my Lord. 
thus much is known of it that it is an indivisible essence belonging to the world of decrees, and that it is not from everlasting, but created. An exact philosophical knowledge of the spirit is not a necessary preliminary to walking in the path of religion, but comes rather as the result of self-discipline and perseverance in that path, as it is said in the Quran, those who strive in our way, verily we will guide them to the right paths. For the carrying on of this spiritual warfare by which the knowledge of oneself and of God is to be obtained, the body may be figured as a kingdom, the soul as its king, and the different senses and faculties as constituting an army. Reason may be called the vizier, or prime minister, passion the revenue collector, and anger the police officer. Under the guise of collecting revenue, passion is continually prone to plunder on its own account, while resentment is always inclined to harshness and extreme severity. Both of these, the revenue collector and the police officer, have to be kept in due subordination to the king, but not killed or expelled, as they have their own proper functions to fulfill. But if passion and resentment master reason, the ruin of the soul infallibly ensues. A soul which allows its lower faculties to dominate the higher is as one who should hand over an angel to the power of a dog, or a Mussulman to the tyranny of an unbeliever. The cultivation of demonic, animal, or angelic qualities results in the production of corresponding characters, which in the day of judgment will be manifested in visible shapes, the sensual appearing as swine, the ferocious as dogs and wolves, and the pure as angels. The aim of moral discipline is to purify the heart from the rust of passion and resentment, till, like a clear mirror, it reflects the light of God. Someone may hear object, but if man has been created with animal and demonic qualities as well as angelic, how are we to know that the latter constitute his real essence, while the former are merely accidental and transitory? To this I answer that the essence of each creature is to be sought in that which is highest in it and peculiar to it. Thus the horse and the ass are both burden-bearing animals, but the superiority of the horse to the ass consists in its being adapted for use in battle. If it fails in this, it becomes degraded to the rank of burden-bearing animals. Similarly with man, the highest faculty in him is reason, which fits him for the contemplation of God. If this, predominates in him, when he dies, he leaves behind him all tendencies to passion and resentment, and becomes capable of association with angels. As regards his mere animal qualities, man is inferior to many animals, but reason makes him superior to them, as it is written in the Quran, to man we have subjected all things in the earth. But if his lower tendencies have triumphed, after death he will ever be looking towards the earth and longing for earthly delights. Now the rational soul in man abounds in, marvels, both of knowledge and power, by means of it he masters arts and sciences, can pass in a flash from earth to heaven and back again, can map out the skies and measure the distances between the stars. By it also he can draw the fish from the sea and the birds from the air, and can subdue to his service animals, like the elephant, the camel, and the horse. His five senses are like five doors opening on the external world, but, more wonderful than this, his heart has a window which opens on the unseen world of spirits. In the state of sleep, when the avenues of the senses are closed, this window is opened and man receives impressions from the unseen world and sometimes foreshadowings of the future. His heart is then like a mirror which reflects what is pictured in the tablet of fate. But, even in sleep, thoughts of worldly things dull this mirror, so, that the impressions it receives are not clear. After death, however, such thoughts vanish and things are seen in their naked reality, and the saying in the Quran is fulfilled, we have stripped the veil from off thee and thy sight today is keen. This opening of a window in the heart towards the unseen also takes place in conditions, approaching those of prophetic inspiration, when intuitions spring up in the mind unconveyed through any sense channel. The more a man purifies himself from fleshly lusts and concentrates his mind on God, the more conscious will he be of such intuitions. Those who are not conscious of them have no right to deny their reality, nor are such intuitions confined only to those of prophetic rank. Just as iron, by sufficient polishing, can be made into a mirror, so any mind by due discipline can be rendered receptive of such impressions. It was at this truth the Prophet hinted when he said, Every child is born with a predisposition towards Islam, then his parents make a Jew, or a Christian, or a star worshipper of him. Every human being has in the depths of his consciousness heard the question Am I not your Lord? and answered yes to it.
But some hearts are like mirrors so befouled with rust and dirt that they give no clear reflections, while those of the prophets and saints, though they are men of like passions with us, are extremely sensitive to all divine impressions. Nor is it only by reason of knowledge acquired and intuitive that the soul of man holds the first rank among created things, but also by reason of power. Just as angels preside over the elements, so does the soul rule the members of the body. Those souls which attain a special degree of power not only rule their own body but those of others also. If they wish a sick man to recover he recovers, or a person in health to fall ill he becomes ill, or if they will the presence of a person he comes to them. According as the effects produced by these powerful souls are good or bad they are termed miracles or sorceries. These souls differ from common folk in three ways. 1. What others only see in dreams they see in their waking moments. 2. While others' wills only affect their own bodies, these, by will power, can move bodies extraneous to themselves. 3. The knowledge which others acquire by laborious learning comes to them by intuition. These three, of course, are not the only marks which differentiate them from common people, but the only ones that come within our cognizance. Just as no one knows the real nature of God but God himself, so no one knows the real nature of a prophet but a prophet. Nor is this to be wondered at, as in everyday matters we see that it is impossible to explain the charm of poetry to one whose ear is insusceptible of cadence and rhythm, or the glories of color to one who is stone blind. Besides mere incapacity, there are other hindrances to the attainment of spiritual truth. One of these is externally acquired knowledge. To use a figure, the heart may be represented as a well, and the five senses as five streams which are continually conveying water to it. In order to find out the real contents of the heart these streams must be stopped for a time, at any rate, and the refuse they have brought with them must be cleared out of the well. In other words, if we are to arrive at pure spiritual truth, we must put away, for the time, knowledge which has been acquired by, external processes and which too often hardens into dogmatic prejudice. A mistake of an opposite kind is made by shallow people who, echoing some phrases which they have caught from Sufi teachers, go about decrying all knowledge. This is as if a person who was not an adept in alchemy were to go about saying, alchemy is better than in gold, and were to refuse gold when it was offered to him. Alchemy is better than gold, but real alchemists are very rare, and so are real Sufis. He who has a mere smattering of Sufism is not superior to a learned man, any more than he who has tried a few experiments in alchemy has ground for despising a rich man. Anyone who will look into the matter will see that happiness is necessarily linked with the knowledge of God. Each faculty of ours delights in that for which it was created, lust delights in accomplishing desire, anger in taking vengeance, the eye in seeing beautiful objects, and the ear in hearing harmonious sounds. The highest function of the soul of man is the perception of truth, in this accordingly it finds its special delight. Even in trifling matters, such as learning chess, this holds good, and the higher the subject matter of the knowledge obtained the greater the delight. A man would be pleased at being admitted into the confidence of a prime minister, but how much more if the king makes an intimate of him and discloses state secrets to him. An astronomer who, by his knowledge, can map the stars and describe their courses, derives more pleasure from his knowledge than the chess player from his. Seeing, then, that nothing is higher than God, how great must be the delight which springs from the true knowledge of him. A person in whom the desire for this knowledge has disappeared is like one who has lost his appetite for healthy food, or who prefers feeding on clay to eating bread. All bodily appetites perish at death with the organs they use, but the soul dies not, and retains whatever knowledge of God it possesses, nay, increases it. An important part of our knowledge of God arises from the study and contemplation of our own bodies, which reveal to us the power, wisdom, and love of the Creator. His power, in that from a mere drop he has built up the wonderful frame of man, his wisdom is revealed in its intricacies and the mutual adaptability of its parts, and his love is shown by his not only supplying such organs as are absolutely necessary for existence, as the liver, the heart, and the brain, but those which are not absolutely necessary, as the hand, the foot, the tongue, and the eye. To these he has added, as ornaments, the blackness of the hair, the redness of lips, and the curve of the eyebrows. Man has been truly termed a microcosm, or little world in himself, 
and the structure of his body should be studied not only by those who wish to become doctors, but by those who wish to attain to a more intimate knowledge of God, just as close study of the niceties and shades of language in a great poem reveals to us more and more of the genius of its author. But, when all is said, the knowledge of the soul plays a more important part in leading to the knowledge of God than the knowledge of our body and its functions. The body may be compared to a steed and the soul to its rider, the body was created for the soul, the soul for the body. If a man knows not his own soul, which is the nearest thing to him, what is the use of his claiming to know others? It is as if a beggar who has not the wherewithal for a meal should claim to be able to feed a town. In this chapter we have attempted, in some degree, to expound the greatness of man's soul. He who neglects it and suffers its capacities to rust or to degenerate must necessarily be the loser in this world and the next. The true greatness of man lies in his capacity for eternal progress, otherwise in this temporal sphere he is the weakest of all things, being subject to hunger, thirst, heat, cold, and sorrow. Those things he takes most delight in are often the most injurious to him, and those things which benefit him are not to be obtained without toil and trouble. As to his intellect, a slight disarrangement of matter in his brain is sufficient to destroy or madden him, as to his power, the sting of a wasp is sufficient to rob him of ease and sleep, as to his temper, he is upset by the loss of a sixpence, as to his beauty, he is little more than nauseous matter covered with a fair skin. Without frequent washing he becomes utterly repulsive and disgraceful. In truth, man in this world is extremely weak and contemptible, it is only in the next that he will be of value, if by means of the alchemy of happiness he rises from the rank of beasts to that of angels. Otherwise his condition will be worse than the brutes, which perish and turn to dust. It is necessary for him, at the same time that he is conscious of his superiority as the climax of created things, to learn to know also his helplessness, as that too is one of the keys to the knowledge of God. Chapter 2. The Knowledge of God It is a well-known saying of the prophet that he who knows himself, knows God, that is, by contemplation of his own being and attributes man arrives at some knowledge of God. But since many who contemplate themselves do not find God, it follows that there must be some special way of doing so. As a matter of fact, there are two methods of arriving at this knowledge, but one is so abstruse that it is not adapted to ordinary intelligences, and therefore is better left unexplained. The other method is as follows, when a man considers himself he knows that there was a time when he was non-existent, as it is written in the Quran, does it not occur to man that there was a time when he was nothing? Further, he knows that he was made out of a drop of water in which there was neither intellect, nor hearing, sight, head, hands, feet, etc. From this it is obvious that, whatever degree of perfection he may have arrived at, he did not make himself, nor can he now make a single hair. How much more helpless, then, was his condition when he was a mere drop of water? Thus, as we have seen in the first chapter, he finds in his own being reflected in miniature, so to speak, the power, wisdom and love of the Creator. If all the sages of the world were assembled, and their lives prolonged for an indefinite time, they could not effect any improvement in the construction of a single part of the body. For instance, in the adaptation of the front and side teeth to the mastication of food, and in the construction of the tongue, salivating glands, and the throat for its deglutition, we find a contrivance which cannot be improved upon. Similarly, whoever considers his hand, with its five fingers of unequal lengths, four of them with three joints and the thumb with only two, and the way in which it can be used for grasping, or for carrying, or for smiting, will frankly acknowledge that no amount of human wisdom could better it by altering the number and arrangement of the fingers, or in any other way. When a man further considers how his various wants of food, lodging, etc., are amply supplied from the storehouse of creation, he becomes aware that God's mercy is as great as his power and wisdom, as he has himself said, my mercy is greater than my wrath, and according to the prophet's saying, God is more tender to his servants than a mother to her suckling child. Thus from his own creation man comes to know God's existence, from the wonders of his bodily frame God's power and wisdom, and from the ample provision made for his various needs God's love. In this way the knowledge of oneself becomes a key to the knowledge of God, not only are man's attributes a reflection of God's attributes, but the mode of existence of man's soul affords some insight into God's mode of existence. That is to say, 
Both God and the soul are invisible, indivisible, unconfined by space and time, and outside the categories of quantity and quality, nor can the ideas of shape, color, or size attached to them. People find it hard to form a conception of such realities as are devoid of quality and quantity, etc., but a similar difficulty attaches to the conception of our everyday feelings, such as anger, pain, pleasure, or love. They are thought concepts, and cannot be cognized by the senses, whereas quality, quantity, etc., are sense concepts. Just as the ear cannot take cognizance of color, nor the eye of sound, so, in conceiving of the ultimate realities, God and the soul, we find ourselves in a region in which sense concepts can bear no part. So much, however, we can see, that, as God is ruler of the universe, and, being himself beyond space and time, quantity and quality, governs things that are so conditioned, so the soul rules the body and its members, being itself invisible, indivisible, and unlocated in any special part. For how can the indivisible be located in that which is divisible? From all this we see how true is the saying of the prophet, God created man in his own likeness, and, as we arrive at some knowledge of God's essence and attributes from the contemplation of the soul's essence and attributes, so we come to understand God's method of working and government and delegation of power to angelic forces, etc., by observing how each of us governs his own little kingdom. To take a simple instance, suppose a man wishes to write the name of God, first of all the wish is conceived in his heart, it is then conveyed to the brain by the vital spirits, the form of the word God takes shape in the thought chambers of the brain, thence it travels by the nerve channels, and sets in motion the fingers, which in their turn set in motion the pen, and thus the name God is traced on paper exactly as it had been conceived in the writer's brain. Similarly, when God wills a thing it appears in the spiritual plane, which in the Quran is called the throne, from the throne it passes, by a spiritual current, to a lower plane called the chair, then the shape of it appears on the tablet of destiny, whence, by the mediation of the forces called angels, it assumes actuality, and appears on the earth in the form of plants, trees, and animals, representing the will and thought of God, as the written letters represent the wish conceived in the heart and the shape present in the brain of the writer. No one can understand a king but a king, therefore God has made each of us a king in miniature, so to speak, over a kingdom which is an infinitely reduced copy of his own. In the kingdom of man God's throne is represented by the soul, the archangel by the heart, the chair by the brain, the tablet by the treasure chamber of thought. The soul, itself unlocated and indivisible, governs the body as God governs the universe. In short, each of us is entrusted with a little kingdom, and charged not to be careless in the administration of it. As regards the recognition of God's providence, there are many degrees of knowledge. The mere physicist is like an ant who, crawling on a sheet of paper and observing black letters spreading over it, should refer the cause to the pen alone. The astronomer is like an ant of somewhat wider vision who should catch sight of the fingers moving the pen, i.e., he knows that the elements are under the power of the stars, but he does not know that the stars are under the power of the angels. Thus, owing to the different degrees of perception in people, disputes must arise in tracing effects to causes. Those whose eyes never see beyond the world of phenomena are like those who mistake servants of the lowest rank for the king. The laws of phenomena must be constant, or there could be no such thing as science, but it is a great error to mistake the slaves for the master. As long as this difference in the perceptive faculty of observers exists, disputes must necessarily go on. It is as if some blind men, hearing that an elephant had come to their town, should go and examine it. The only knowledge of it which they can obtain comes through the sense of touch, so one, handles the animal's leg, another his tusk, another his ear, and, according to their several perceptions, pronounce it to be a column, a thick pole, or a, quilt each taking a part for the whole. So the physicist and astronomer confound the laws they perceive with the lawgiver. A similar mistake is attributed to Abraham in the Quran, where it is related that he turned successively to stars, moon, and sun as the objects of his worship, till, grown aware of him who made all these, he exclaimed, I love not them that set. We have a common instance of this referring to second causes what ought to be referred to the first cause in the case of so-called illness. For instance, if a man ceases to take any interest in worldly matters, conceives a distaste for common pleasures, and appears sunk in depression, 
the doctor will say, this is a case of melancholy, and requires such and such a prescription. The physicist will say, this is a dryness of the brain caused by hot weather and cannot be relieved till the air becomes moist. The astrologer will attribute it to some particular conjunction or opposition of planets. Thus far their wisdom reaches, says the Quran. It does not occur to them that what has really happened is this, that the Almighty has a concern for the welfare of that man, and has therefore commanded his servants, the planets or the elements, to produce such a condition in him that he may turn away from the world to his Maker. The knowledge of this fact is a lustrous pearl from the ocean of inspirational knowledge, to which all other forms of knowledge are as islands in the sea. The doctor, physicist, and astrologer are doubtless right each in his particular branch of knowledge, but they do not see that illness is, so to speak, a cord of love by which God draws to himself the saints concerning whom he has, said, I was sick and ye visited me not. Illness itself is one of those forms of experience by which man arrives at the knowledge of God, as he says by the mouth of his prophet, sicknesses themselves are my servants, and are attached to my chosen. The foregoing remarks may enable us to enter a little more fully into the meaning of those exclamations so often on the lips of the faithful, God is holy. Praise be to God. There is no God but God. God is great. Concerning the last we may say that it does not mean that God is greater than creation, for creation is his manifestation as light manifests the sun, and it would not be correct to say that the sun is greater than its own light. It rather means that God's greatness immeasurably transcends our cognitive faculties, and that we can only form a very dim and imperfect idea of it. If a child asks us to explain to him the pleasure which exists in wielding sovereignty, we may say it is like the pleasure he feels in playing bat and ball, though in reality the two have nothing in common except that they both come under the category of pleasure. Thus, the exclamation God is great means that his greatness far exceeds all our powers of comprehension. Moreover, such imperfect knowledge of God as we can attain to is not a mere speculative knowledge, but must be accompanied by devotion and worship. When a man dies he has to do with God alone, and if we have to live with a person, our happiness entirely depends on the degree of affection we feel towards him. Love is the seed of happiness, and love to God is fostered and developed by worship. Such worship and constant remembrance of God implies a certain degree of austerity and curbing of bodily appetites, not that a man is intended altogether to abolish these, for then the human race would perish, but strict limits must be set to their indulgence, and as a man is not the best judge in his own case as to what these limits should be, he had better consult some spiritual guide on the subject. Such spiritual guides are the prophets and the laws which they have laid down under divine inspiration prescribe the limits which must be observed in these matters. He who transgresses these limits wrongs his own soul, as it is written in the Quran. Notwithstanding this clear pronouncement of the Quran there are those who, through their ignorance of God, do transgress these limits, and this ignorance may be due to several different causes. Firstly, there are some who, failing to find God by observation, conclude that there is no God and that this world of wonders made itself, or existed from everlasting. They are like a man who, seeing a beautifully written letter, should suppose that it had written itself without a writer, or had always existed. People in this state of mind are so far gone in error that it is of little use to argue with them, such are some of the physicists and astronomers to whom we referred above, some, through ignorance of the real nature of the soul, repudiate the doctrine of a future life, in which man will be called to account and be rewarded or punished. They regard themselves as no better than animals or vegetables, and equally perishable. Some, on the other hand, believe in God and a future life but with a weak belief. They say to themselves, God is great and independent of us, our worship or abstinence from worship is a matter of entire indifference to him. Their state of mind is like that, of a sick man who, when prescribed a certain regime by his doctor, should say, well, if I follow it or don't follow it, what does it matter to the doctor? It certainly does not matter to the doctor, but the patient may destroy himself by his disobedience. Just as surely as unchecked sickness of body ends in bodily death, so does uncured disease of the soul end in future misery, according to the saying of the Quran, only those shall be saved who come to God with a sound heart. A fourth kind of unbelievers are those who say, the law tells us to abstain from anger, lust, and hypocrisy. This is plainly impossible, 
for man is created with these qualities inherent in him. You might as well tell us to make black white. These foolish people ignore the fact that the law does not tell us to uproot these passions, but to restrain them within due limits, so that, by avoiding the greater sins, we may obtain forgiveness of the smaller ones. Even the prophet of God said, I am a man like you, and get angry like others, and in the Quran it is written, God loves those who swallow down their anger, not those who have no anger at all. A fifth class lay stress on the beneficence of God, and ignore his justice, saying to themselves, well, whatever we do, God is merciful. They do not consider that, though God is merciful, thousands of human beings perish miserably in hunger and disease. They know that whosoever wishes for a livelihood, or for wealth, or learning, must not merely say, God is merciful, but must exert himself. Although the Quran says, every living creature's support comes from God, it is also written, man obtains nothing except by striving. The fact is, such teaching is really from the devil, and such people only speak with their lips and not with their heart. A sixth class claim to have reached such a degree of sanctity that sin cannot affect them. Yet, if you treat one of them with disrespect, he will bear a grudge against you for years, and if one of them be deprived of a morsel of food which he thinks his due, the whole world will appear dark and narrow to him. Even if any of them do really conquer their passions, they have no right to make such a claim, for the prophets, the highest of humankind, constantly confessed and bewailed their sins. Some of them had such a dread of sin that they even abstained from lawful things, thus, it is related of the prophet that, one day, when a date had been brought to him he would not eat it, as he was not sure that it had been lawfully obtained. Whereas these free livers will swallow gallons of wine and claim, I shudder as I write, to be superior to the prophet whose sanctity was endangered by a date, while theirs is unaffected by all that wine. Surely they deserve that the devil should drag them down to perdition. Real saints know that he who does not master his appetites does not deserve the name of a man, and that the true Muslim is one who will cheerfully acknowledge the limits imposed by the law. He who endeavors, on whatever pretext, to ignore its obligations is certainly under satanic influence, and should be talked to, not with a pen, but with a sword. These pseudo-mystics sometimes pretend to be drowned in a sea of wonder, but if you ask them what they are wondering at they do not know. They should be told to wonder as much as they please, but at the same time to remember that the Almighty is their creator and that they are his servants. Chapter 3 – The Knowledge of This World This world is a stage or marketplace passed by pilgrims on their way to the next. It is here that they are to provide themselves with provisions for the way, or, to put it plainly, man acquires here, by the use of his bodily senses, some knowledge of the works of God, and, through them, of God himself, the sight of whom will constitute his future beatitude. It is for the acquirement of this knowledge that the spirit of man has descended into this world of water and clay, as long as his senses remain with him he is said to be in this world, when they depart, and only his essential attributes remain, he is said to have gone to the next world. While man is in this world, two things are necessary for him, first, the protection and nurture of his soul, secondly, the care and nurture of his body. The proper nourishment of the soul, as above shown, is the knowledge and love of God, and to be absorbed in the love of anything but God is the ruin of the soul. The body, so to speak, is simply the riding animal of the soul, and perishes while the soul endures. The soul should take care of the body, just as a pilgrim on his way to Mecca takes care of his camel, but if the pilgrim spends his whole time in feeding and adorning his camel, the caravan will leave him behind, and he will perish in the desert. Man's bodily needs are simple, being comprised under three heads, food, clothing, and a dwelling place, but the bodily desires which were implanted in him with a view to procuring these are apt to rebel against reason, which is of later growth than they. Accordingly, as we saw above, they require to be curbed and restrained by the divine laws promulgated by the prophets. Considering the world with which we have for a time to do, we find it divided into three departments, animal, vegetable, and mineral. The products of all three are continually needed by man and have given rise to three principal occupations, those of the weaver, the builder, and the worker in metal. These, again, have many subordinate branches, such as tailors, masons, smiths, etc. None can be quite independent of others, 
This gives rise to various business connections and relations and these two frequently afford occasions, for hatred, envy, jealousy, and other maladies of the soul. Hence come quarrels and strife, and the need of political and civil government and knowledge of law. Thus the occupations and businesses of the world have become more and more complicated and troublesome, chiefly owing to the fact that men have forgotten that their real necessities are only three, clothing, food, and shelter, and that these exist only with the object of making the body a fit vehicle for the soul in its journey towards the next world. They have fallen into the same mistake as the pilgrim to Mecca, mentioned above, who, forgetting the object of his pilgrimage and himself, should spend his whole time in feeding and adorning his camel. Unless a man maintains the strictest watch he is certain to be fascinated and entangled by the world, which, as the prophet said, is a more potent sorcerer than Harut and Marat. The deceitful character of the world comes out in the following ways. In the first place, it pretends that it will always remain with you, while, as a matter of fact, it is slipping away from you, moment by moment, and bidding you farewell, like a shadow which seems stationary, but is actually always moving. Again, the world presents itself under the guise of a radiant but immoral sorceress, pretends to be in love with you, fondles you, and then goes off to your enemies, leaving you to die of chagrin and despair. Jesus, upon whom be peace, saw the world revealed in the form of an ugly old hag. He asked her how many husbands she had possessed, she replied that they were countless. He asked whether they had died or been divorced, she said that she had slain them all. I marvel, he said, at the fools who see what you have done to others, and still desire you. This sorceress decks herself out in gorgeous and jeweled apparel and veils her face, then she goes forth to seduce men, too many of whom follow her to their own destruction. The prophet has said that in the judgment day the world will appear in the form of a hideous witch with green eyes and projecting teeth. Men, beholding her, will say, Mercy on us, who is this? The angels will answer, This is the world for whose sake you quarreled and fought and embittered one another's lives. Then she will be cast into hell, whence she will cry out, O Lord, where are those, my former lovers? God will then command that they be cast after her. Whoever will seriously contemplate the past eternity during which the world was not in existence, and the future eternity during which it will not be in existence, will see that it is essentially like a journey, in which the stages are represented by years, the leagues by months, the miles by days, and the steps by moments. What words, then, can picture the folly of the man who endeavors to make it his permanent abode, and forms plans ten years ahead regarding things he may never need, seeing that very possibly he may be under the ground in ten days. Those who have indulged without limit in the pleasures of the world, at the time of death will be like a man who has gorged himself to repletion on delicious viands and then vomits them up. The deliciousness has gone, but the disgrace remains. The greater the abundance of the possessions which they have enjoyed in the shape of gardens, male and female slaves, gold, silver, etc., the more keenly they will feel the bitterness of parting from them. This is a bitterness which will outlast death, for the soul which has contracted covetousness as a fixed habit will necessarily in the next world suffer from the pangs of unsatisfied desire. Another dangerous property of worldly things is that they at first appear as mere trifles, but each of these so-called trifles branches out into countless ramifications until they swallow up the whole of a man's time and energy. Jesus, on whom be peace, said, the lover of the world is like a man drinking seawater, the more he drinks, the more thirsty he gets, till at last he perishes with thirst unquenched. The prophet said, you can no more mix with the world without being contaminated by it than you can go into water without getting wet. The world is like a table spread for successive relays of guests who come and go. There are gold and silver dishes, abundance of food and perfumes. The wise guest eats as much as is sufficient for him, smells the perfumes, thanks his host, and departs. The foolish guest, on the other hand, tries to carry off some of the gold and silver dishes, only to find them wrenched out of his hands and himself thrust forth, disappointed and disgraced. We may close these illustrations of the deceitfulness of the world with the following short parable. Suppose a ship to arrive at a certain well-wooded island, the captain of the ship tells the passengers he will stop a few hours there, and that they can go on shore for a short time, but warns them not to delay too long. Accordingly the passengers disembark and stroll in different directions, 
The wisest, however, return after a short time, and, finding the ship empty, choose the most comfortable places in it. A second band of the passengers spend a somewhat longer time on the island, admiring the foliage of the trees and listening to the song of the birds. Coming on board, they find the best places in the ship already occupied, and have to content themselves with the less comfortable ones. A third party wander still farther, and, finding some brilliantly colored stones, carry them back to the ship. Their lateness in coming on board compels them to stow themselves away in the lower parts of the ship, where they find their loads of stones, which by this time have lost all their brilliancy, very much in their way. The last group go so far in their wanderings that they get quite out of reach of the captain's voice calling them to come on board, and at last he has to sail away without them. They wander about in a hopeless condition and finally either perish of hunger or fall a prey to wild beasts. The first group represents the faithful who keep aloof from the world altogether and the last group the infidels who care only for this world and nothing for the next. The two intermediate classes are those who preserve their faith, but entangle themselves more or less with the vanities of things present. Although we have said so much against the world, it must be remembered that there are some things in the world which are not of it, such as knowledge and good deeds. A man carries what knowledge he possesses with him into the next world, and, though his good deeds have passed, yet the effect of them remains in his character. Especially is this the case with acts of devotion, which result in the perpetual remembrance and love of God. These are among those good things which, as the Quran says, pass not away. Other good things there are in the world, such as marriage, food, clothing, etc., which a wise man uses just in proportion as they help him to attain to the next world. Other things which engross the mind, causing it to cleave to this world and to be careless of the next, are purely evil and were alluded to by the prophet when he said, The world is a curse, and all which is in it is a curse, except the remembrance of God, and that which aids it. Chapter 4 The Knowledge of the Next World as regards the joys of heaven and the pains of hell which will follow this life, all believers in the Quran and the traditions are sufficiently informed. But it often escapes them that there is also a spiritual heaven and hell, concerning the former of which God said to his prophet, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive the things which are prepared for the righteous. In the heart of the enlightened man there is a window opening on the realities of the spiritual world, so that he knows, not by hearsay or traditional belief, but by actual experience, what produces wretchedness or happiness in the soul just as clearly and decidedly as the physician knows what produces sickness or health in the body. He recognizes that knowledge of God and worship are medicinal, and that ignorance and sin are deadly poisons for the soul. Many even so-called learned men, from blindly following others' opinions, have no real certainty in their beliefs regarding the happiness or misery of souls in the next world but he who will attend to the matter with a mind unbiased by prejudice will arrive at clear convictions on this matter. The effect of death on the composite nature of man is as follows, man has two souls, an animal soul and a spiritual soul, which latter is of angelic nature. The seat of the animal soul is the heart, from which this soul issues like a subtle vapor and pervades all the members of the body, giving the power of sight to the eye, the power of hearing to the ear, and to every member the faculty of performing its own appropriate functions. It may be compared to a lamp carried about within a cottage, the light of which falls upon the walls wherever it goes. The heart is the wick of this lamp, and when the supply of oil is cut off for any reason, the lamp dies. Such is the death of the animal soul. With the spiritual, or human soul, the case is different. It is indivisible, and by it man knows God. It is, so to speak, the rider of the animal soul, and when that perishes it still remains, but is like a horseman who has been dismounted, or like a hunter who has lost his weapons. That steed and those weapons were granted the human soul that by means of them it might pursue and capture the phoenix of the love and knowledge of God. If it has effected that capture, it is not a grief but rather a relief to be able to lay those weapons aside, and to dismount from that weary steed. Therefore the prophet said, Death is a welcome gift of God to the believer. But alas for that soul which loses its steed and hunting weapons before it has captured the prize, its misery and regret will be indescribable.
a little further consideration will show how entirely distinct the human soul is from the body and its members. Limb after limb may be paralyzed and cease working, but the individuality of the soul is unimpaired. Further, the body which you have now is no longer the body which you had as a child, but entirely different, yet your personality now is identical with your personality then. It is therefore easy to conceive of it as persisting when the body is done with altogether, along with its essential attributes which were independent of the body, such as the knowledge and love of God. This is the meaning of that saying of the Quran, the good things abide, but if, instead of carrying away with you knowledge, you depart in ignorance of God, this ignorance also is an essential attribute, and will abide as darkness of soul and the seed of misery. Therefore the Quran says, he who is blind in this life will be blind in the next life, and astray from the path. The reason of the human spirit seeking to return to that upper world is that its origin was from thence, and that it is of angelic nature. It was sent down into this lower sphere against its will to acquire knowledge and experience, as God said in the Quran, go down from hence, all of you, there will come to you instruction from me, and they who obey the instruction need not fear, neither shall they be grieved. The verse, I breathed into man of my spirit, also points to the celestial origin of the human soul. Just as the health of the animal soul consists in the equilibrium of its component parts, and this equilibrium is restored, when impaired, by appropriate medicine, so the health of the human soul consists in a moral equilibrium which is maintained and repaired, when needful, by ethical instruction and moral precepts. As regards its future existence, we have already seen that the human soul is essentially independent of the body. All objections to its existence after death based on the supposed necessity of its recovering its former body fall, therefore, to the ground. Some theologians have supposed that the human soul is annihilated after death and then restored, but this is contrary both to reason and to the Quran. The former shows us that death does not destroy the essential individuality of a man, and the Quran says, Think not that those who are slain in the path of God are dead, nay, they are alive, rejoicing in the presence of their Lord, and in the grace bestowed on them. Not a word is said in the law about any of the dead, good or bad, being annihilated. Nay, the prophet is said to have questioned the spirits of slain infidels as to whether they had found the punishments, with which he had threatened them, real or not. When his followers asked him what was the good of questioning them, he replied, they hear my words better than you do. Some Sufis have had the unseen world of heaven and hell revealed to them when in a state of death-like trance. On their recovering consciousness their faces betray the nature of the revelations they have had by marks of joy or terror. But no visions are necessary to prove what will occur to every thinking man, that when death has stripped him of his senses and left him nothing but his bare personality, if while on earth he has too closely attached himself to objects perceived by the senses, such as wives, children, wealth, lands, slaves, male and female, etc., he must necessarily suffer when bereft of those objects. Whereas, on the contrary, if he has as far as possible turned his back on all earthly objects and fixed his supreme affection upon God, he will welcome death as a means of escape from worldly entanglements, and of union with him whom he loves. In his case the prophet's sayings will be verified, Death is a bridge which unites friend to friend, and the world is a paradise for infidels, but a prison for the faithful. On the other hand, the pains which souls suffer after death all have their source in excessive love of the world. The Prophet said that every unbeliever, after death, will be tormented by ninety-nine snakes, each having nine heads. Some simple-minded people have examined the unbelievers' graves and wondered at failing to see these snakes. They do not understand that these snakes have their abode within the unbeliever's spirit, and that they existed in him even before he died, for they were his own evil qualities symbolized, such as jealousy, hatred, hypocrisy, pride, deceit, etc., every one of which springs, directly or remotely, from love of the world. Such is the doom of those who, in the words of the Quran, set their hearts on this world rather than on the next. If those snakes were merely external they might hope to escape their torment, if it were but for a moment, but, being their own inherent attributes, how can they escape? Take, for instance, the case of a man who has sold a slave girl without knowing how much he was attached to her till she is quite out of his reach. Then the love of her, hitherto dormant, wakes up in him with such intensity as to amount to torture, stinging him like a snake, 
so that he would fain cast himself into fire or water to escape it. Such is the effect of love of the world, which those who have it often suspect not till the world is taken from them, and then the torment of vain longing is such that they would gladly exchange it for any number of mere external snakes and scorpions. Every sinner thus carries with him into the world beyond death the instruments of his own punishment, and the Quran says truly, Verily you shall see hell, you shall see it with the eye of certainty, and hell surrounds the unbelievers. It does not say will surround them, for it is round them even now. Some may object, if such is the case, then who can escape hell, for who is not more or less bound to the world by various ties of affection and interest? To this we answer that there are some, notably the Fakirs, who have entirely disengaged themselves from love of the world. But even among those who have worldly possessions such as wife, children, houses, etc., there are those, who, though they have some affection for these, love God yet more. Their case is like that of a man who, though he may have a dwelling which he is fond of in one city, when he is called by the king to take up a post of authority in another city, does so gladly, as the post of authority is dearer to him than his former dwelling. Such are many of the prophets and saints, others there are, and a great number, who have some love to God, but the love of the world so preponderates in them that they will have to suffer a good deal of pain after death before they are thoroughly weaned from it. Many profess to love God, but a man may easily test himself by watching which way the balance of his affection inclines when the commands of God come into collision with some of his desires. The profession of love to God which is insufficient to restrain from disobedience to God is a lie. We have seen above that one kind of spiritual hell is the forcible separation from worldly things to which the heart clave too fondly. Many carry about within them the germs of such a hell without being aware of it, hereafter they will feel like some king who, after living in luxury, has been dethroned and made a laughingstock. The second kind of spiritual hell is that of shame, when a man wakes up to see the nature of the actions he committed in their naked reality. Thus he who slandered will see himself in the guise of a cannibal eating his dead brother's flesh, and he who envied as one who cast stones against a wall, which stones, rebounding, put out the eyes of his own children. This species of hell, i.e., of shame, may be symbolized by the following short parable, suppose a certain king has been celebrating his son's marriage. In the evening the young man goes off with some companions and presently returns to the palace, as he thinks, intoxicated. He enters a chamber where a light is burning and lies down, as he supposes, by his bride. In the morning, when Serbanus returns, he is aghast to find himself in a mortuary of fire worshippers, his couch a beer, and the form which he mistook for that of his bride the corpse of an old woman beginning to decay. On emerging from the mortuary with his garments all soiled, what is his shame to see his father, the king, approaching with a retinue of soldiers. Such is a feeble picture of the shame those will feel in the next world who in this have greedily abandoned themselves to what they thought were delights. The third spiritual hell is that of disappointment and failure to reach the real objects of existence. Man was intended to mirror forth the light of the knowledge of God, but if he arrives in the next world with his soul thickly coated with the rust of sensual indulgence he will entirely fail of the object for which he was made. His disappointment may be figured in the following way, Suppose a man is passing with some companions through a dark wood. Here and there, glimmering on the ground, lie variously colored stones. His companions collect and carry these and advise him to do the same. For, say they we have heard that these stones will fetch a high price in the place whither we are going. He, on the other hand, laughs at them and calls them fools for loading themselves in the vain hope of gain, while he walks free and unencumbered. Presently they emerge into the full daylight and find that these colored stones are rubies, emeralds, and other jewels of priceless value. The man's disappointment and chagrin at not having gathered some when so easily within his reach may be more easily imagined than described. Such will be the remorse of those hereafter, who, while passing through this world, have been at no pains to acquire the jewels of virtue and the treasures of religion. This journey of man through the world may be divided into four stages the sensuous, the experimental, the instinctive, the rational. In the first he is like a moth which, though it has sight, has no memory, and will singe itself again and again at the same candle. In the second stage he is like a dog which, having once been beaten, will run away at the sight of a stick. In the third he is like a horse or a sheep, 
both of which instinctively fly at the sight of a lion or a wolf, their natural enemies, while they will not fly from a camel or a buffalo, though these last are much greater in size. In the fourth stage man altogether transcends the limits of the animals and becomes capable, to some extent, of foreseeing and providing for the future. His movements at first may be compared to ordinary walking on land, then to traversing the sea in a ship, then, on the fourth plane, where he is conversant with realities, to walking on the sea, while beyond this plane there is a fifth, known to the prophets and saints, whose progress may be compared to flying through the air. Thus man is capable of existing on several different planes, from the animal to the angelic, and precisely in this lies his danger, i.e., of falling to the very lowest. In the Quran it is written, we propose the burden, i.e., responsibility or free will, to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they refuse to undertake it. But man took it upon himself, verily he is ignorant, neither animals nor angels can change their appointed rank and place, but man may sink to the animal or soar to the angel, and this is the meaning of his undertaking that burden of which the Quran speaks. The majority of men choose to remain in the two lower stages mentioned above, and the stationary are always hostile to the travelers or pilgrims, whom they far outnumber. Many of the former class, having no fixed convictions about the future world, when mastered by their sensual appetites, deny it altogether. They say that hell is merely an invention of theologians to frighten people, and they regard theologians themselves with thinly veiled contempt. To argue with fools of this kind is of very little use. This much, however, may be said to such a man, with the possible result of making him pause and reflect, do you really think that the 124,000 prophets and saints who believed in the future life were all wrong, and you are right in denying it? If he replies, yes, I am as sure as I am that two are more than one, that there is no soul and no future life of joy and penalty, then the case of such a man is hopeless, all one can do is to leave him alone, remembering the words of the Quran, though thou call them to instruction, they will not be instructed. But, should he say that a future life is possible but that the doctrine is so involved in doubt and mystery that it is impossible to decide whether it be true or not, then one may say to him, then you had better give it the benefit of the doubt. Suppose you are about to eat food and someone tells you a serpent has spat venom on it, you would probably refrain and rather endure the pangs of hunger than eat it, though your informant may be in jest or lying. Or suppose you are ill and a charm writer says, give me a rupee and I will write a charm which you can tie round your neck and which will cure you, you would probably give the rupee on the chance of deriving benefit from the charm. Or if an astrologer say, when the moon has entered a certain constellation, drink such and such a medicine, and you will recover, though you may have very little faith in astrology, you very likely would try the experiment on the chance that he might be right. And do you not think that reliance is as well placed on the words of all the prophets, saints, and holy men, convinced as they were of a future life, as on the promise of a charm writer or an astrologer? People take perilous voyages in ships for the sake of merely probable profit, and will you not suffer a little pain of abstinence now for the sake of eternal joy hereafter? The Lord Ali once, in arguing with an unbeliever, said, If you are right, then neither of us will be any the worse in the future, but if we are right, then we shall escape, and you will suffer. This he said not because he himself was in any doubt, but merely to make an impression on the unbeliever. From all that we have said it follows that man's chief business in this world is to prepare for the next. Even if he is doubtful about a future existence, reason suggests that he should act as if there were one, considering the tremendous issues at stake. Peace be on those who follow the instruction. Chapter 5 The Love of God The love of God is the highest of all topics, and is the final aim to which we have been tending hitherto. We have spoken of spiritual dangers as they hinder the love of God in a man's heart, and we have spoken of various good qualities as being the necessary preliminaries to it. Human perfection resides in this, that the love of God should conquer a man's heart and possess it wholly, and even if it does not possess it wholly it should predominate in the heart over the love of all other things. Nevertheless, rightly to understand the love of God is so difficult a matter that one sect of theologians have altogether denied that man can love a being who is not of his own species, and they have defined the love of God as consisting merely in obedience. 
Those who hold such views do not know what real religion is. All Muslims are agreed that the love of God is a duty. God says concerning the believers, he loves them and they love him. And the prophet said, till a man loves God and his prophet more than anything else, he has not the right faith. When the angel of death came to take the soul of Abraham the latter said, have you ever seen a friend take his friend's life? God answered him, have you ever seen a friend unwilling to see his friend? Then Abraham said, O oh Azrael, take my soul. The following prayer was taught by the prophet to his companions, O oh God, grant me to love thee and to love those who love thee, and whatsoever brings me nearer to thy love, and make thy love more precious to me than cold water to the thirsty. Hassan Bosri used to say, He who knows God loves him, and he who knows the world hates it. We come now to treat of love in its essential nature. Love may be defined as an inclination to that which is pleasant. This is apparent in the case of the five senses, each of which may be said to love that which gives it delight, thus the eye loves beautiful forms, the ear music, etc. This is a kind of love we share with the animals. But there is a sixth sense, or faculty of perception, implanted in the heart, which animals do not possess, through which we become aware of spiritual beauty and excellence. Thus, a man who is only acquainted with sensuous delights cannot understand what the prophet meant when he said he loved prayer more than perfumes or women, though the last two were also pleasant to him. But he whose inner eye is open to behold the beauty and perfection of God will despise all outward sights in comparison, however fair they may be. The former kind of man will say that beauty resides in red and white complexions, well-proportioned limbs, and so forth, but he will be blind to moral beauty, such as men refer to when they speak of such and such a man as possessing a beautiful character. But those possessed of inner perception find it quite possible to love the departed great, such as the caliphs Omar and Abu Bakr, on account of their noble qualities, though their bodies have long been mingled with the dust. Such love is directed not towards any outward form, but towards the inner character. Even when we wish to excite love in a child towards anyone, we do not describe their outward beauty or form, etc., but their inner excellencies. When we apply this principle to the love of God we shall find that He alone is really worthy of our love, and that, if anyone loves Him not, it is because He does not know Him. Whatever we love in anyone we love because it is a reflection of Him. It is for this reason that we love Muhammad, because he is the prophet and the beloved of God, and the love of learned and pious men is really the love of God. We shall see this more clearly if we consider what are the causes which excite love. The first cause is this, that man loves himself and the perfection of his own nature. This leads him directly to the love of God, for man's very existence and man's attributes are nothing else but the gift of God but for whose grace and kindness man would never have emerged from behind the curtain of non-existence into the visible world. Man's preservation and eventual attainment to perfection are also entirely dependent upon the grace of God. It would indeed be a wonder, if one should take refuge from the heat of the sun under the shadow of a tree and not be grateful to the tree, without which there would be no shadow at all. Precisely in the same way, were it not for God, man would have no existence nor attributes at all, Wherefore, then, should he not love God, unless he be ignorant of him? Doubtless fools cannot love him, for the love of him springs directly from the knowledge of him, and whence should a fool have knowledge? The second cause of this love is that man loves his benefactor, and in truth his only benefactor is God, for whatever kindness he receives from any fellow creature is due to the immediate instigation of God. Whatever motive may have prompted the kindness he receives from another, whether the desire to gain religious merit or a good name, God is the agent who set that motive to work. The third cause is the love that is aroused by contemplation of the attributes of God, His power and wisdom, of which human power and wisdom are but the feeblest reflections. This love is akin to that we feel to the great and good men of the past, such as the Imam Malik and the Imam Shafi, though we never expect to receive any personal benefits from them, and is therefore a more disinterested kind of love. God said to the prophet David, that servant is dearest to me who does not seek me from fear of punishment or hope of reward, but to pay the debt due to my deity. And in the Psalms it is written, who is a greater transgressor than he who worships me from fear of hell or hope of heaven, if I had created neither, should I not then have deserved to be worshipped? The fourth cause of this love is the affinity between man and God, which is referred to in the saying of the prophet, 
Verily God created man in his own likeness. Furthermore, God has said, My servant seeks proximity to me, that I may make him my friend, and when I have made him my friend I become his ear, his eye, his tongue. Again, God said to Moses, I was sick, and thou didst not visit me. Moses replied, O God, thou art Lord of heaven and earth, how cool dost thou be sick? God said, A certain servant of mine was sick, hadst thou visited him, thou wouldst have visited me. This is a somewhat dangerous topic to dwell upon, as it is beyond the understanding of common people, and even intelligent men have stumbled in treating of it, and come to believe in incarnation and union with God. Still, the affinity which does exist between man and God disposes of the objection of those theologians mentioned above, who maintain that man cannot love a being who is not of his own species. However great the distance between them, man can love God because of the affinity indicated in the saying, God created man in his own likeness. The Vision of God All Muslims profess to believe that the vision of God is the summit of human felicity, because it is so stated in the law, but with many this is a mere lip profession which arouses no emotion in their hearts. This is quite natural, for how can a man long for a thing of which he has no knowledge? We will endeavor to show briefly why the vision of God is the greatest happiness to which a man can attain. In the first place, every one of man's faculties has its appropriate function which it delights to fulfill. This holds good of them all, from the lowest bodily appetite to the highest form of intellectual apprehension. But even a comparatively low form of mental exertion affords greater pleasure than the satisfaction of bodily appetites. Thus, if a man happens to be absorbed in a game of chess, he will not come to his meal, though repeatedly summoned, and the higher the subject matter of our knowledge, the greater is our delight in it. For instance, we would take more pleasure in knowing the secrets of a king than the secrets of a vizier. Seeing, then, that God is the highest possible object of knowledge, the knowledge of him must afford more delight than any other. He who knows God, even in this world, dwells, as it were, in a paradise, the breadth of which is as the breadth of the heavens and the earth, a paradise the fruits of which no envy can prevent him plucking, and the extent of which is not narrowed by the multitude of those who occupy it. But the delight of knowledge still falls short of the delight of vision, just as our pleasure in thinking of those we love is much less than the pleasure afforded by the actual sight of them. Our imprisonment in bodies of clay and water, and entanglement in the things of sense constitute a veil which hides the vision of God from us, although it does not prevent our attaining to some knowledge of him. For this reason God said to Moses on Mount Sinai, Thou shalt not see me. The truth of the matter is this, that, just as the seed of man becomes a man, and a buried date stone becomes a palm tree, so the knowledge of God acquired on earth will in the next world change into the vision of God, and he who has never learnt the knowledge will never have the vision. This vision will not be shared alike by all who know, but their discernment of it will vary exactly as their knowledge. God is one, but he will be seen in many different ways, just as one object is reflected in different ways by different mirrors, some showing it straight, and some distorted, some clearly and some dimly. A mirror may be so crooked as to make even a beautiful form appear misshapen, and a man may carry into the next world a heart so dark and distorted that the sight which will be a source of peace and joy to others will be to him a source of misery. He, in whose heart the love of God has prevailed over all else, will derive more joy from this vision than he in whose heart it has not so prevailed, just as in the case of two men with equally powerful eyesight, gazing on a beautiful face, he who already loves the possessor of that face will rejoice in beholding it more than he who does not. For perfect happiness mere knowledge is not enough, unaccompanied by love, and the love of God cannot take possession of a man's heart till it be purified from love of the world, which purification can only be effected by abstinence and austerity. While he is in this world a man's condition with regard to the vision of God is like that of a lover who should see his beloved's face in the twilight, while his clothes are infested with hornets and scorpions, which continually torment him. But should the sun arise and reveal his beloved's face in all its beauty, and the noxious vermin leave off molesting him, then the lover's joy will be like that of God's servant, who, released from the twilight and the tormenting trials of this world, beholds him without a veil. Abu Suleiman said, he who is busy with himself now will be busy with himself then, and he who is occupied with God now will be occupied with him then. Yahya ibn Mu'az relates, 
I watched Bayezid by Stami at prayer through one entire night, when he had finished he stood up and said, O Lord, some of thy servants have asked and obtained of thee the power to perform miracles, to walk on the sea, and to fly in the air, but this I do not ask, some have asked and obtained treasures, but these I do not ask. Then he turned, and, seeing me, said, Are you there, Yahya? I replied, Yes. He asked, Since when? I answered, For a long time. I then asked him to reveal to me some of his spiritual experiences. I will reveal, he answered, what is lawful to tell you. The Almighty showed me his kingdom, from its loftiest to its lowest, he raised me above the throne and the seat and all the seven heavens. Then he said, Ask of me whatsoever thing thou desirest. I answered, Lord, I wish for nothing beside thee, verily, he said, Thou art my servant. On another occasion Bayezid said, Were God to offer thee the intimacy with himself of Abraham, the power and prayer of Moses, the spirituality of Jesus, yet keep thy face directed to him only, for he has treasure surpassing even these. One day a friend said to him, For thirty years I have fasted by day and prayed by night and have found none of that spiritual joy of which thou speakest. Bayezid answered, If you fasted and prayed for three hundred years, you would never find it, how is that? Asked the other, Because, said Bayezid, your selfishness is acting as a veil between you and God. Tell me, then, the cure, it is a cure which you cannot carry out. However, as his friend pressed him to reveal it, Bayezid said, Go to the nearest barber and have your beard shaved, strip yourself of your clothes, with the exception of a girdle round your loins. Take a horse's nose bag full of walnuts, hang it round your neck, go into the bazaar and cry out, Any boy who gives me a slap on the nape of my neck shall have a walnut. Then, in this manner, go where the caddy and the doctors of the law are sitting. Bless my soul, said his friend, I really can't do that, do suggest some other remedy. This is the indispensable preliminary to a cure, answered Bayezid, but, as I told you, you are incurable. The reason Bayezid indicated this method of cure for want of relish in devotion was that his friend was an ambitious seeker after place and honor. Ambition and pride are diseases which can only be cured in some such way. God said unto Jesus, O Jesus, when I see in my servants' hearts pure love for myself unmixed with any selfish desire concerning this world or the next, I act as guardian over that love. Again, when people asked Jesus what is the highest work of all? He answered, to love God and to be resigned to his will. The Saint Rabia was once asked whether she loved the prophet, the love of the Creator, she said, has prevented my loving the creature. Ibrahim ben Adam, in his prayers, said, O God, in my eyes heaven itself is less than a gnat in comparison with the love of thee and the joy of thy remembrance which thou hast granted me. He who supposes that it is possible to enjoy happiness in the next world apart from the love of God is far gone in error, for the very essence of the future life is to arrive at God as at an object of desire long aimed at and attained through countless obstacles. This enjoyment of God is happiness, but if he had no delight in God before, he will not delight in him then, and if his joy in God was but slight before it will be but slight then. In brief, our future happiness will be in strict proportion to the degree in which we have loved God here. But, and may God preserve us from such a doom, if in a man's heart there has been growing up a love of what is opposed to God, the conditions of the next life will be altogether alien to him, and that which will cause joy to others will to him cause misery. This may be illustrated by the following anecdote, a certain scavenger went into the perfume seller's bazaar, and, smelling the sweet scents, fell down unconscious. People came round him and sprinkled rose water upon him and held musk to his nose, but he only became worse. At last one came who had been a scavenger himself, he held a little filth under the man's nose and he revived instantly, exclaiming, with a sigh of satisfaction, Ah! This is perfume indeed! Thus in the next life a worldling will no longer find the filthy lucre and the filthy pleasures of the world the spiritual joys of that world will be altogether alien to him and but increase his wretchedness. For the next world is a world of spirit and of the manifestation of the beauty of God, happy is that man who has aimed at and acquired affinity with it. All austerities, devotions, studies have the acquirement of that affinity for their aim, and that affinity is love. This is the meaning of that saying of the Quran, 
he who has purified his soul is happy, sins and lusts directly oppose the attainment of this affinity, therefore the Quran goes on to say, and he who has corrupted his soul is miserable. 5. Those who are gifted with spiritual insight have really grasped this truth as a fact of experience, and not a merely traditional maxim. Their clear perception of it leads them to the conviction that he by whom it was spoken was a prophet indeed, just as a man who has studied medicine knows when he is listening to a physician. This is a kind of certainty which requires no support from miracles such as the conversion of a rod into a snake, the credit of which may be shaken by apparently equally extraordinary miracles performed by magicians. The Signs of the Love of God Many claim to love God, but each should examine himself as to the genuineness of the love which he professes. The first test is this, he should not dislike the thought of death, for no friend shrinks from going to see a friend. The prophet said, whoever wishes to see God, God wishes to see him. It is true a sincere lover of God may shrink from the thought of death coming before he has finished his preparation for the next world, but if he is sincere, he will be diligent in making such preparation. The second test of sincerity is that a man should be willing to sacrifice his will to God's, should cleave to what brings him nearer to God, and should shun what places him at a distance from God. The fact of a man's sinning is no proof that he does not love God at all, but it proves that he does not love him with his whole heart. The Saint Fudhale said to a certain man, If anyone asks you whether you love God, keep silent, for if you say, I do not love him, you are an infidel, and if you say, I do, your deeds contradict you. The third test is that the remembrance of God should always remain fresh in a man's heart without effort, for what a man loves he constantly remembers, and if his love is perfect he never forgets it. It is possible, however, that, while the love of God does not take the first place in a man's heart, the love of the love of God may, for love is one thing and the love of love another. The fourth test is that he will love the Quran, which is the word of God, and Muhammad, who is the prophet of God, if his love is really strong, he will love all men, for all are God's servants, nay, his love will embrace the whole creation, for he who loves anyone loves the works he composes and his handwriting. The fifth test is, he will be covetous of retirement and privacy for purposes of devotion, he will long for the approach of night, so that he may hold intercourse with his friend without let or hindrance. If he prefers conversation by day and sleep at night to such retirement, then, his love is imperfect. God said to David, Be not too intimate with men, for two kinds of persons are excluded from my presence, those who are earnest in seeking reward and slack when they obtain it, and those who prefer their own thoughts to the remembrance of me. The sign of my displeasure is that I leave such to themselves. In truth, if the love of God really take possession of the heart all other love is excluded. One of the children of Israel was in the habit of praying at night, but, observing that a bird sang in a certain tree very sweetly, he began to pray under that tree, in order to have the pleasure of listening to the bird. God told David to go and say to him, Thou hast mingled the love of a melodious bird with the love of me, thy rank among the saints is lowered. On the other hand, some have loved God with such intensity that, while they were engaged in devotion, their houses have caught fire and they have not noticed it. A sixth test is that worship becomes easy. A certain saint said, During one space of thirty years I performed my night devotions with great difficulty, but during a second space of thirty years they became a delight. When love to God is complete no joy is equal to the joy of worship. The seventh test is that lovers of God will love those who obey him and hate the infidels and the disobedient, as the Quran says, they are strenuous against the unbelievers and merciful to each other. The prophet once asked God and said, O Lord, who are thy lovers? And the answer came, those who cleave to me as a child to its mother, take refuge in the remembrance of me as a bird seeks the shelter of its nest, and are as angry at the sight of sin as an angry lion who fears nothing. Chill books. Audiobooks with relaxing music, visuals and subtitles to help you stay engaged.